and welcome to episode 163 of Foundry Roundtable, the podcast exclusively covering the Foundry for Star Trek Online. And because of technical difficulties tonight, Green Dragoon and I have swapped identities. So, he's Drogon 71, and I'm Green Dragoon. Oh, I'm never going to be able to keep this straight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. Uninstall that Windows update, and then we can switch back. Yeah, I'm unfortunately going to have to uninstall and reinstall a lot of things. System system recovery point. I don't think it's quite that bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, with us, uh, of course, are our partners in crime, Mark Hawkman and Duncan Idaho. Hello. Hello. It's, it's like always in and crime. Mark. I... Yeah, you're Mark tonight and he's Duncan. <laughs> okay. Everybody switched. So anyway, um, we uh, are, are going to start tonight with a, showing off a, a little foundry map build that I discovered the other day. Um, it's called VIP Officer Quarters Excelsior by Chris Dubois. So we're going to jump in here. Bringing a very Sorry, eclectic group this time. Thing. This is just a, uh, you know, like a little one map mission build uh, for quarters. Uh, it's pretty nice. It's pretty simple, but it's a good example of um, a simple build that really works and works well. And uh, of course, we're always happy to show off interesting things that we find that people have made in the foundry. That's what we're here for among many other things. Mm -hmm. Pointing out tiny details on Kish Bash pieces. <laughs> I'm never going to let him let go of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm going to keep making Kit Bash Voltron. Ooh, this look, looks look, Duncan. There's a, there's a costume. Tell me every single piece on it. <laughs> With pleasure. You'll see that the one, the, the book pieces are... Oh, wait. Oh, let's see. I could do it based on type I haven't gotten to the point where I could ex say exactly which color every single piece is to. <laughs> it's conceivable I may one day reach that level of zen. Not sure that's what I'd call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, states before which I get commissioned and put into the pa tiny padded room. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> we got to build it in the foundry first. <laughs> So here we are. Um, um, this is the little uh, officer quarters, VIP lounge, that sort of thing. Um, it's just got everything you you possibly could need in a little build like this. Uh, I, I do particularly like the sonic shower, hmm. which I believe is. I don't even know. What um, that is. It's one of the. Duncan, tell us. It, it, yeah, it's the one of the uh, cases. Um, yeah, it's the big hologram case. There we go. You no, know, from the old yeah. ESD. Yeah. I do like how they flipped around the console here for oh something that's approaching a pull-out toilet. Sync assembly as well. Hmm. Has anyone checked to see whether these are uh, windows or if they just look like they might be windows? Um, they uh, actually put a window in there. There's a slight color change where you see it's hitting the uh, column. Yeah. yeah, I would say so it would be nice if uh, to put in like a uh, wall down, like sunken, to uh, kind of act as a yeah, lip that, along that the bottom. Comes up a little ways. Yeah, and I found a good one is one of the other the sort of standard white generic wall. Because the uh, fed walls that this person used, those don't have a um, uh, top to them. Well, I would just but think of the same material as the uh, columns here. Oh, yeah. Uh, so building block... Uh, oh, 03. The dark one. Dark gray. So there's not a lot to this map. I just thought it was a, a neat looking one. 
Um, yeah, it's uh, got a lot of. Uh, it, it's just sort of like it's like he said. It's got the right amount of detail where you need it. Yeah. The only the only criticism I would have is maybe uh, those lights on the ceiling of the main room in the quarters are maybe a little. There's too many of them, or there, or you should use smaller ones or something. Yeah, I think they're trying to Those light are a bit the entire much. space, um, but they could have also used the uh, uh, ESD ones like they did in the hallway. Yeah, yeah, I have to say that's a lot of those uh, white bubble things to have on the ceiling. Yeah, because I think the only reason you would use this many is that if you wanted to just bathe this entire area in white light. So, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, I think it's a little much. But otherwise, yeah, I do like, you know, little touches like using the shelving pieces, putting an intrepid class right on top of that. And just also making yeah. sure that this had a large amount of window space too. It it feels like a set from Star Trek. Yeah. You know, especially TNG. The, yeah, it's, it's a TNG kind of thing. I will uh, also notice that every once in a while, one of the uh, stars will fly through the hallway. So they might need uh, yeah, to move that out just a bit. I, I, I was uh, wondering if anyone else had seen that too. I'm waiting for it now. I just saw it, yeah. Yeah, though, just a bit too close, so move it out a bit and it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it does make a nice effect for out, you know, out the window. Obviously, we are in a ship at warp. Yeah, and good choice on the uh, backdrop too. All right, so we got uh, some news to go through. Uh, first off, we, we've got some additions to the Foundry. Uh, the light cruisers that were just released um, have made it in about 85% of the way. Uh, we got the, the Klingon and Romulan uh, light cruisers, which are in, and the new Miranda-class model uh, that Thomas the Cat built or no, um, it was uh, it was somebody else who built that one. Donnie uh, Versaggia. Yeah. Or Donnie Versaggia. <laughs> the name people keep mispronouncing. Something something like that. Yeah. But his first name is Donnie. Yeah. But we so we do have the updated Miranda model um, on our in, in the costume creator, and uh, included in that is the little parts. Um, I think they're like sensor arrays or something for the Saratoga <laughs> style oh, model. It's like like big phaser beeps. <laughs> they they look like you know X-wing cannons, but because <laughs> this is Star Trek, <laughs> and uh, that's and, why the know, Borg ship yeah, ship we're... weapons on Federation ships don't look like weapons. <laughs> yeah, unless well, I mean, unless you're the Vengeance, I think most people were saying that they were probably like sensor pods. Yeah, uh, because apparently the uh, Miranda has no main deflector. <laughs> I'm kind of curious. Uh, it never did. Like, I thought that was the sort of like behind the bridge, um, right on kind of the back end. You have that dome that blew up in the movie. Are, are, are we sure the deflector isn't that weird notch in the front of the hull? I was going to say back of the hull. It's almost like a Rorschach test of like, where do you think the deflector is on the Miranda class? <laughs> Just go through all the small detail yeah. pieces. This was back when, uh, you know, they didn't, I guess have that rule that it needed to have yeah. some sort of big deflector. <laughs> they just accepted one, like as Plus, like especially after the uh, explanation on, on Enterprise. It's like you know we're just going to accept the fact that a small particle of dust is going to blow fist sized holes in the front of the hull. <laughs> well, well, it's funny. Know, it probably, it may have to do with um, the fact that Gene Roddenberry was not as involved on Star Trek: Wrath of Khan as he was on previous uh, Star Trek, yeah. and, and okay, probably was not in on that design process. Plus the, uh, the to be honest, the uh, d that the rules that he came up with were kind of um, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, applied whenever he, if he felt like it. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, also the they, fact that uh, the in at least in TOS, it, the main deflector was never really. Did they ever actually say what it was for? In TOS, no, probably not, because it well, wasn't I, until I, like got, TNG and the TNG really technical manual that it really got into. Yeah, hold on. The Miranda, I'm looking at schematics now, and these might be unofficial, but there is a deflector listed. It's Where? tiny, though. It's it's on the, um, it's sort of, you have the bridge, then you have on the bottom of the saucer section, you've got another sort of corresponding bulge. It's hmm. on the, it's in a, it's in a small depression in that. Send me the link to the pic okay. you're looking at. 
I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm looking at the. Um, I'm trying to get a better uh, picture though. The the little to model ship on the shelf here, and I, uh, that that was one of the things that caught my attention is that there's the bridge on top of the ship, and then there's a matching bulge on the bottom with no obvious function. Although right, it I'm doesn't gonna, really look like a I'm, deflector dish. There you go. I put the well, uh, link tradition. in the chat because I found this on the uh, old tablet. So it's labeled 18 uh, on the diagram. And this is for the Reliant. Mm. So yeah, it's basically below the bridge on the underside of the saucer. Although I think that might, <laughs> whether or not that it was originally be, just designed. Be some, just be some fan saying it needs to have a deflector, so I'm going to pick this. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, probably, oh, it's probably definitely... most likely. Because, you know, like, I was thinking on, if you look at the top section of the hull, you got a really big sphere on the back end of that saucer on the front side, or the top side. I always thought that was the deflector. So you think of that? Are you talk uh, let's see, I'm trying to find a diagram where that's actually labeled. Uh, let's see. Uh, there we go. It's number 10. It's called the photon control assembly. So it's just something else. Or yeah. Yeah. Oh, or a fusion power assembly. So it's something that's labeled as it's labeled as something else. But, um, yeah. Well, in so any anyway, case, it's uh, certainly nice to have the screen accurate Miranda model in the foundry, uh, as well as the game. Of course, um, obviously, I I plan to fly one. I can't quite buy it yet, but I plan to. Mm. I'm. I was really planning on it, but I'm just like, oh, I just don't know. I'm saving up. I'm basically <laughs> saving up Zen. But by the time I'm due for another ship, it's it probably going to be. It, yeah, it's probably going to come up to something else. Or I might start actually saving for a Kelvin timeline constitution class. Those are nice. Because I, I keep seeing those. It's like, ah, oh, I kind of <laughs> want one. I'll tell you the best thing about that is. Every time you swing the camera around it, it feels like you're in the movies. Mm. And it looks surprisingly good from, like, I like the angles on that ship, except directly from the back. I think that the nacelles are a little too sort of curved up, a little too high. But for, like, for me, it's like, uh, small. it's just small potatoes. I, I, I want that ship. I would say most most ships in Star Trek have at least one bad angle, except maybe the Enterprise D. Uh, well, the D had a few. Yeah, okay, Wor worst the angle from the so Enterprise D. Saucer heavy. Let's see. But that's another one where you know it's become so iconic that, it, and you see it so many times in establishing shots and the title sequence where, you know, when you're flying it in game and, and you start swinging the camera around it and, and you find these same angles that you saw in the show and you're like, Oh man. And it looks so spot on <laughs> now, mm -hmm. now that, and that one, it was Thomas that revamped that one. And yeah, did such a fantastic job on it. You know, it, well, well, speaking of that, it's one of those things that I've always found to be amazingly hilarious is, um, how, uh, Uh, specifically the uh, uh, Galaxy X, where they made it so that it was literally almost exactly identical to the TV show, and no one remembered it the way it was in the TV show. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't have like five nacelles and giant guns and turned into a giant robot. Mm -hmm. That's what I remember, right? <laughs> well, I... The, the discussions that, that crop up over ship scale are always the ones that amuse me. Mm. People get very fired up over that. <laughs> yeah, and it's one of the hardest, like, people yeah. assume that it's basically this hard, fast thing that they always, always followed in every single shot of the show. But that's Which not right. It wasn't. Like, the there, Defiant. There, were something, just... there were something like three different measurements for the Defiant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, then, it was super inconsistent. Oh well, yeah, and then they they put the galaxy class in some of the same shots for oh I think it was the episode with the binars as they put the Constitution class Enterprise at basically the same scale to a space dock. So that basically yeah. had to imply that that space dock was huge. It's because that's the, the only way the D could fit in the doors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
but I have the footage lying around and we might as well use it. Yeah. The, and the I mean, thing is, is that, you know, there, there's very few ships in the game that are not properly scaled. I think, what is it? The scimitar is one. Hmm. Um, Deep Space Nine is not properly scaled because when they put it in the game as properly scaled, people thought it was way, way, way too small. It was a well, perception thing yeah. rather than a reality thing. Well, again, well, that kind of comes back to it, things like the TV they would... show DS9 was shown as being more than one size. So it's all depending on which version of the size people yeah. actually think of when they think of DS9. And for me, the one that I would always think of most is the one you see in the opening credits where you have multiple galaxy class uh, ships inside the uh, little docking pylon area. Mm-hmm. But then if you go to a shot where they're sort of unloading a runabout, then DS9 becomes remarkably smaller. I know. Yeah, it's not just, or oh, depends on if it's, it. it's yeah. like that old sci-fi writers have no sense of scale thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. And and the, the only which is why on... it's rather hilarious that they they did not they decided not to mess with the scale of the universe class. <laughs> yeah. uh, also the uh, Kelvin Constitution scale. too. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the vengeance, and yeah, yeah, because they actually they had numbers for those ones, and they're like, you know what, this is what you know, this is what's listed. So, mm. hey, so it's canon. It. Yeah. Well, didn't they scale up the uh, JJ Constitution because yeah. they went back to the uh, nope. looked at the original nope. and it was nope. like way too small to fit what was actually seen on the show inside. Um, at, at least that's, the I numbers. Think that's another they, one of them. Yeah, I think it was they, I, I heard that there were actually numbers listed for the size of the ship, and that's what they went with. And it turned out that was I mean, equivalent no, they, to a um, galaxy class, basically. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I had also they, heard they, that. No, I remember Thomas saying that they got the numbers directly from CVS or, or Paramount or whoever it yeah. was. And then that's the numbers they went with. So I don't know if they were playing around with the scaling beyond that. But it, but it's pro- it's proper to what you see in the movie because, I mean, like the, the shuttle bay. To have to have that scale of shuttle bay, the ship has to be much bigger than the TOS oh. constitution. Although well, um, it'll be interesting to see if that holds up for like all the bridge shots, because that's just a window. Yeah. The, the way I understand it, there's two ways of assessing the scale based solely on the first movie. One of them is to look at the size of the windows on the outside of the hull, and the other is the shuttle bay scene. Yeah. The shuttle base scene, if you use that for the scale, it gives you something approximately the same size as the official scale, which is what we use for Stowe. The other way of doing it gives you something about the same as the TOS Constitution, which this is based on looking at the size of the little things on the uh, hull and you know, like, okay, that's a window, so this di- amount of distance on the outer hull is X size, blah, 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 blah. Some people think that uh, the CGI model was originally designed to to be a much smaller ship than what we actually ended up with in the film. But because I, think I of- heard that. Oh, that's that's interesting. And, and, but then and, they... I, and I think it was scaled up later to match some of the other shots or something like that. Well, I mean, they've got a lot of shots in in like the originals or in the 2009 movie that are like literally flying across the hall into the uh, um, the window of the bridge. So, I mean, obviously they had to make the interior and exterior match for those shots. Well, mm-hmm. I, I always say that um, if you're trying to look for internal consistency in Star Trek, you are barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, Case in point, our other bit of news. <laughs> um, we, we got the uh, the first real trailer for uh, Star Trek Discovery this week. Woo! At the CBS Upfronts. Um, and, and a lot of the discussion online has revolved around, you know, consistency with, you know, it's supposed to be about a decade before the original series and it looks nothing like the original series. Uh, I kind of re- arrived at a rather interesting point online today. Uh, just trying to you know, hammer these points out. Someone was complaining about the fact that the, you know, the new ship, you know, it's not following the same style as the TOS ships. 
the timeline between the series is basically Enterprise D to Enterprise E. So <laughs> for me, it's just like, you know what? It looks different, but that does make sense in every single time period we've looked at so far. <laughs> so yeah, I mean that's yeah. a good point. I mean I didn't consider that as by any bit because I'm I'm just not a purist like that. I don't. Oh yeah. My... Well, I don't my, need my, it. My general take on it like is TOS. that Federation ships look like whatever the person who was designing the ship <laughs> made it look like. Because yeah. there are certain types of hull configuration that are relatively common. Then there's all the other weird stuff that they've thrown out over the years. Yeah. If you look at and, if you look at naval ships today, you know one of one class of ship doesn't necessarily look like the other classes. Mm-hmm. No. Nope. Not a bit. Yeah. I mean, no. it, and even within relatively short times, too. I will say it'll be kind of interesting um, to see how they handle it. Because, I mean, you know, at some point as this uh, series goes on, they're going to be tempted to do something along the lines of, oh, hey, look, it's one of the brand new Constitution class ships. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm they're, they're not going to want to pass up that opportunity. So it'll be interesting to see how they uh, so meld them. I have a theory. I have a theory. I mean, if we want to get into larger discussion of the show, I mean, go for it. But I've I've got a grand theory on what the first episode plot is in its entirety. Does it involve time travel? No. Ooh, so, okay, so it's different it, than it's, mine. It's, it's, sort of, it's putting the pieces. It, it's it's putting the pieces together. So I think. Well, I mean, so, I mean, this is important to to Stowe because I, I I have a feeling that we are we will get discovery content at some point probably not for a while oh sure but also I think I know how that might happen <laughs> um or just like there there might be a really great opening so it's basically revolves around just who are the new Klingons hmm. and people are basically been assuming that they are the same type of Klingons as we have seen if you assume that their new sort of overly ritualized very ornate style doesn't necessarily it's not trying to represent old klingons this is a new group of klingons and i think the major point is that if for a star trek show nowadays to focus on social issues and really hit a you know some really good strong points in terms of modern dialogue you might have to start actually you know establish an extremist faction that society has to deal with and i think that's who these klingons are they are extremist mm. klingons who have found something that is really important to them, specifically the um, sarcophagus in the trailer, an ancient warrior with who is either an important person of interest or is carrying something of interest to them. Kalos? So the first step, it might be Kalos. I mean, who knows? It, or it could yeah. be like, it, or it could I mean, be um, who Kalos fought. I mean, so just these guys starting are, off here, it, it, that's the first thing I thought of is that, whole thing like with Worf and that the sort of Kylos and stuff. Yeah, so it's basically, I think the plot is, it's after the Klingon War, the Fed is trying to basically pull itself back together. It's got the Shenzhou as in a sort of a more militarized um, style of vessel. So it's small, it's sleek, and it probably spent some time fighting. And I think the transition to the series is going from that combative style of the um, basically the Klingon Federation War into a style which is more reminiscent of TOS, as in there's going to be an intermediate ship that is going to be the uh, forebearer to the Constitution class. So in mm. the first episode, the Shenzhou encounters the extremist Klingons and gets destroyed by them. And then the lead mm. character has to then take command of a new ship that has the range to pursue these Klingons into uncharted space. And that's the discovery. And it's basically a prototype for the type of vessel that the Constitution class is going to become. Which means is that the series is basically going to be leading up to TOS by establishing the first crew that was really on a Constitution type style mission, as in really going to deep space much further than the NX classes did. But hmm. now, it's in a similar type of ship. It's not a Constitution class itself, but it's similar. So it's going to be pursuing extremist Klingons into the unknown and trying to resolve, you know, a, a revenge plot with the main character, trying to deal with her ship being blown up, um, trying to reconcile the extremist Klingons with the standard Klingons and discovering new stuff along the way. So that's what I think the series is going to be about, but we'll see how much of that actually plays out across the show. To be honest, I think the best thing that uh, it could do is to uh, find a way to subtly 
um, de deteriorate that whole uh, alien monoculture thing as far as the Klingons go. Because that's one of the things that's most annoying about the Klingons is that there are, there's a specific way people tend to characterize them. But from what we've actually seen in the show is that we've seen Klingons who are like wildly outside what you, you have as the standard stereotype. And, you know, it's just one of those things where like it's just good to show more people things that are like what people would consider to be outliers, I guess. Yeah. And, and it's always think... really interesting when they do that. I mean, I remember, uh, the enterprise episode, which was a little bit of a ripoff of star Trek six, let's be honest, but, um, it had that really interesting exchange where, uh, the Klingon lawyer is talking to Archer about how, you know, the, the sort of breakdown of Klingon society where everybody wants to be warriors and everything else is going by the wayside. Uh -huh. Um, and Amy's lamenting that fact. And, uh, uh, it's very interesting stuff, I thought. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I like that's what I'm looking forward to. And I'm very careful not to necessarily assume that the Klingon, like as much of the online discussion is assuming, is that these Klingons are just Klingons. It's like, well, mm -hmm. no, is that really fitting what the writers are talking about with the show? It makes a lot more sense if these guys are really sort of a sub faction who are going to be doing something that both the KDF and the Fed both disapprove of, resulting, you know, leading to a much more complicated situation. Yeah, a, sub, a sub faction or, or some kind of subspecies even almost. Yeah. I was thinking like, like a cult, like a cult of yeah, whoever Kalos defeated. And then they find what they Molar, assume is his body. Yeah, Molar. So we'll see how much of this plays mm. out. So I just wanted to get that out there so I can point back <laughs> to this episode if I'm right. Because, as it turns out, we're somewhat prescient when it comes to our foundry abilities. I, I <laughs> on, on occasion, made, yeah. Yeah, on occasion. I accidentally made Mass Effect Andromeda. Mm -hmm. And I also, <laughs> I also in my first AEI mission, I have the USS Discovery captained by an African-American officer who is a little bit on the <laughs> side. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's in stow. It's, yeah, Trident in part one. I've got the discovery in there with a very, uh, oh, God, I might have to actually retcon this because I think so, it's a so little. So what, what did you, what what type of ship did you use for the, your discovery? I, I used a Nebula, a Nebula class back then. Mm, so, fits. I mean, it fit. It um, fits the name. But, yeah. Those are yeah. science vessels after all. <laughs> but, yeah, it's like, oh, wait, can I get retroactively hit for violating the Nebula? <laughs> <laughs> I made it first. Oh, I, I doubt it. No. <laughs> uh, recursive EULA violations. Because yeah. mm -hmm. I almost got Only into if that. You admit it on the air, okay. which you just no. did. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, that... I mean, I, I, for me, it's like you know, every everything you see in trailers is it, it lacks context. Yeah. You know, you, you don't know. You, you're hearing some lines. You don't know necessarily know what they mean because you don't know what happened just before and what happens just after. Yeah. Um, occasionally, they intercut conversations. You know, it looks like somebody's saying this line to an, another character in the trailer, but in reality, they said it to themselves or they said it on, on the communicator to a completely different character. <laughs> you know, Ooh. so uh, it's that, hard. That, it's that, hard to really. That that's something that uh, j just popped in my head. Is that. I've mentioned on the show this uh, TV series called Face Off that they did on sci-fi where, um, well, it, it, the basic thing is that it's, it's a contest where, where people do these uh, movie-style makeup things. Well, one of the things that they would do sometimes on Face Off is when they were doing the previews at the beginning of the episode for what was going to be in the episode, they would jump back and forth between different points of view and you, you see one of the judges talking and then you see uh one of the contestants on the show but it's what what you see isn't that judge talking to the contestant that's immediately before or after the judge talking necessarily it's just the two of them kind of mixed together <laughs> well do you remember yeah. the old well actually they still do this of course you know um on network TV, uh, you know, they'll, they'll have put together promos for next week's episode that they run at the end of this week's episode. Mm -hmm. And Oh my God, how many times have they misled us 
in one of those. Yeah. I mean, you know, the whole uh, Seven of Nine kissing Harry Kim thing turned out to be in his dream. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and of course they used that shot in in the promo for that episode uh, without that context. Yeah. So mm-hmm. and it's also because you might have completely different people putting the trailers together versus the people who are actually making the content. Oh yeah, so. I mean it's uh, most of the time it's marketing people. Yeah, so I was just I would... just going through footage saying, "Hey, how can we make this look good?" And that's what you get. And especially for something that's big big and complicated for like, you know, a Star Trek plot, it's yeah pretty hard just to take pieces of that apart except when things are blowing up <laughs> and, and a and this is going to be a plot that spans the whole season i mean yeah, it's not that's... it's not an episodic plot so i mean yeah. it's going to be huge and, and they bumped that up to 15 episodes too yes so yeah, i was I, I mean that, i find that to be a good sign and i also this reminds me of sign. the uh uh scene from uh, voyager with uh them starting the captain proton uh um, holodeck program and it does the previews and Harry Kim is complaining about how inaccurate the previews are. <laughs> like, like, our ship didn't blow up in flames. That's a little mad. <laughs> oh, we gotta just, okay, you gotta get that, like, you know, now, if you ever see people complaining online, find that clip and then just post that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will say another great sign is just the fact that they did not show a space battle in the trailer is that that's not what they focused on in showing is that they didn't try to say, Hey, this is going to be whiz bang action. They tried to really push the setting. They tried to push the dialogue and the characters. And we did get a lot, especially on the uh, lead character too, with some hints about her backstory. Hmm. So I take it. It's strongly implied that she is at least part Vulcan, right? I think she was raised by raised. Yeah. Raised by Vulcan. Because they said that you'll never learn to speak Vulcan, and they're off being raised by wolves. That seems like it, it seems like <laughs> that she was sort of adopted at a later age than an early age. Because in an early age, picking up a new language is simple. But if she's older in trying to learn a second language, that would be harder. So that's where I was sort of leaning a little bit more to being adopted by Vulcans. No, she definitely doesn't have the pointed oh, ears. So. She doesn't have the pointed ears. And she also doesn't have the temperament later on of your classic Spock. Mm. Well, you said mentioned Sarek, and I think it's good to point out that, uh, remember, Sarek is the uh, Vulcan ambassador to Earth. So, yeah. so I, it might bring him into they, these kind of scenarios. And it might be interesting if, say, Sarek was actually her adopted father because then there's the possibility of including my uh, a little baby spock or young spock or adolescent spock depending on the age i guess i mean we're only 10 years behind well okay yeah, it's only it, 10 it flashed years behind, so yeah so it, yeah so it would so be you're, you're adolescent spock like in his you know 20s yeah well well, whatever, well whatever the vulcan equivalent is yeah. well the the uh, first thing that thought that I thought of was the fact that Spock and his brother had a very different approach to logic. Which of course makes me wonder if the stereotypical Vulcan attitude is really something that is actually ubiquitous to Vulcans or if it's one of those things that certain Vulcans do and not necessarily. There's always going to be, you know, radicals and, and people who go off on and other beliefs and that sort of thing. Uh, and I think even in, even in Vulcan society, Cybok hmm. could be part of Star Trek discovery. <laughs> you know, you know who else could be? I was just thinking about this. You know, who else could be part of discovery who could make a cameo Tuvok. Ooh, he could. He is that old. He is. That I old? Just, yeah. Now I he'd just probably be about someone, is he? I just <laughs> well, someone that, I don't that, know about that. that. Hilarious. He he served with Sulu on the Excelsior during Star Trek. Yeah, Six. but that was decades uh-huh. after oh. this, and he was oh, fresh. Yeah. We don't we don't know how old he was during that. Hang on, yeah. it could be his third career. <laughs> he could be on his <laughs> third career in um. Well, because I mean, he's yeah. a brand new ensign in, on Sulu's ship. Yeah, I mean, he, he is really fresh. So yeah. it could be that he's a young kid, or <gasps> he could he was be born in twenty two sixty four. Ah, uh, wait. So, uh, oh crap! I'm when, terrible on the dates the, in the DS. When's Discovery supposed to be set? Uh, the cage. Do, 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 do. 
I was looking up all the years for things when I was making the Atlas, the uh, the Atlas lore blog. <laughs> now I've forgotten, you know, when the five year mission was. Dang it, Wikipedia! You have let me down. I just noticed that the, that this couch we're sitting on is shaped like a candy cane. <laughs> okay, um, so the date twenty two fifty four on the cage. Hmm. Twenty two fifty four. So, so, so twenty two fifty four. The original series. Okay, so yeah, he's not born until after the original series. Okay. Okay. So um, I, can't, I'm can't kind quite of wondering that if maybe we might see someone like Valeris, though. Possibly. But it, like, I don't think they're probably they'll they'll probably it, limit how many random cameos they have. I mean, it could be <laughs> that you see someone who has that name in you know subtle format. But I would sort of say that if they do do a cameo, it's probably going to be a little bit, you know, it's going to be pretty special, especially after Into Darkness kind of showed that people don't necessarily respond well to a lot of the random cameos, like cameos for cameo's sake. Yeah, say if it was me, I I would limit the cameos. I'd rather have the show be its own thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. So Sarek is a good, but then beyond that, Sarek is a good touchstone. And certainly don't mind seeing more of the character, and they picked a great actor to play him. So, you know, I, I, I'm okay with that. But I, I would rather have the show go kind of go off in its own direction. Oh yeah, and I think that there's, with, with I think the really bold and I think really interesting uh, step of the Klingons, it seems that it's not afraid to sort of say, you know what, I want to do something different, and we'll see how this goes. And that that would kind of answer a lot of the criticisms about. Um, you know, oh, if you do a prequel, you're limiting yourself and you're limiting the stories you can tell. Well, not necessarily. Yeah, right? Discovery yeah. is basically just saying, nope. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how much you want to connect back to the thing you're a prequel of. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think that you, can, you the... can limit yourself or you can not. Well, we're close enough to uh, TOS that we don't have to do any of that silly uh, what is a photon torpedo stuff from Enterprise. Oh, yeah. um, but at the same time, we're <laughs> just far enough lines? back and we don't know that much about the, well, the events that led up to uh, TOS. Yeah, that I think I, there's I, there's room to explore. And I'm I'm really excited for the Starfleet in this era because it's sort of it's established enough from like after Enterprise, but you can say it's still in a little bit like trying to get on its feet to what it is in TOS. So I think it's a sort of a good potentially a good uh, transition point. Because they can sort of they can they can write it a bunch of ways, surprisingly, given where they are. Yeah. So if well, we another thing that I like about this time setting is it, it, it gives them an opportunity to take a, a different look at the political climate in the galaxy. Yeah. So which is not so, something I mean, that TOS always touched on a lot. The, the it was usually one... just the Enterprise kind of out by itself. The main political entity that they did, dealt with in TOS was the Klingons. I yeah. mean, the Romulans had basically been doing the same thing that you see them doing at the beginning of TNG and deciding, like, okay, you stay out of our space, we'll stay out of yours, and quit bothering us. Yeah, although and that's, Romulans that's, are going to be a little tricky. Um like it would be interesting, but like it, it's sort of like they're kind of where like it's kind of I don't know if they'll invoke invoke the Romulans as much because it would directly step on TOS a little bit with uh, Balance of Terror, mm-hmm. but it, like with all the other factions, I mean they've got a great opportunity. I mean the fact that they got a right jelly on the bridge. even Enterprise had to do a lot of uh, dancing around the idea of nobody's seen a Romulan until TOS. <laughs> they had to yeah. find some interesting workarounds. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I thought like they actually had. I thought they handled that one pretty well. I mean, he was. Yeah, he was welcome. <laughs> and they definitely got to play around a lot with with uh, oh like the viewers know what a Romulan is, but. Uh, we can still say, oh, ah, because, uh, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that was actually something that they handled rather well, I think, because uh, they gave themselves an out in that Spock was specific, that it was specifically that uh, no one had actually seen the, I guess you could say, face of a Romulan uh, prior to Balance of Terror. 
and that the name Romulan was people didn't really know what it meant because of the fact that apparently this is a name that had been chosen long enough after the sundering that uh, the Vulcans didn't know what it meant. So one of of the things that, um, if you guys have ever read the uh, Federation, the first 150 years book, it goes into into great detail on the Romulan War. You know, a a version of it, obviously, this Mm -hmm. is soft Mm -hmm. canon. and and a part of it is that there's there's really not a lot of ground engagements and and the few that there are there's basically no survivors on the Federation side to report back that hey they look like Vulcans. Mm. Yeah, that that's the that's the thing I've heard most often is that it was such a uh, take no prisoners sort of war that uh, basically people you know either you lived or you died and it, it pre- wasn't much of a middle ground. I get the impression that the uh, Earth Romulan War is as much a psychological war as it was a actual fighting war. Yeah, and that would well according, that would according to that the book, there's too. maybe there's like maybe four or five major engagements, and then they uh, declared a ceasefire and established mm. the neutral zone. Um, so I've been doing a little bit of uh, research uh, in the background here, and. Uh, uh, according to what I pull out, pulled off of uh, Memory Alpha, the uh, um, first year of TOS is in 2265, um, yeah. which, for the record, is like Tuvok would have been like two or three. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Tuvok. So, um, so we're, so I'm sure he's very cute. Will be 2255 or thereabouts. Uh, yes. Maybe. Funny thing, uh, I mean, I was just comparing comparing and contrasting over in the Kelvin timeline, the, their enterprise launches in three years later in 2258. Hmm. So this would have been right around the same time that, uh, uh, Kirk was entering Starfleet Academy in the, uh, in the Kelvin timeline, mm. which hmm. wouldn't probably wouldn't yeah. be too far. Well, I'm not sure how far, answer. I'm not sure how yeah, far off it would be for uh, inquiring minds want to know. Hmm. Well, let me check something yeah. here real quick. There, but that does. There's still many, many un- unanswered questions about discovery. Yeah. And Although I, that I does, think uh, just going to add one thing is that that does kind of torpedo the idea that this is going to be in a JJ universe movie. <laughs> no, yeah, it's sure. after it's sure. after the split. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically it's like, hey, we're we're, we're already sort of operating in around the same time, but see, this is what the prime universe looks like. So, um, one of the other unanswered questions, of course, and we, we refer to this a little bit is, uh, you know, what, what's going to come to stow? I was stow? thinking that if the Klingons are a new faction, we get the 25th century equivalent of them. Hmm. Or, or at the very least, you yeah. know, the customization options. Yeah. So I was like, as a lockbox. So well, I think for sure we'll get some ships. ships. I, mean, yeah. I want the pointy. I want the pointy Klingon armor. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> that's coming An- right. <laughs> another uh, another fun little date thing. At the time of Star Trek Discovery, Kirk will be in his third year at the Academy. Mm. That's interesting. Of a five-year program. So. We could say see like a teenage Kirk, mm-hmm. or it could be, uh, it, he, or like when they end the series, they have Kirk on as a cameo. Oh, they would be. Funny but, if they but I mean, yeah, but the fact that he's Kirk is so young. But I mean, mm-hmm. it means that they have yeah, got he, room to recast him. Yeah, so he'd be yeah. basically a junior officer. Uh, and what if I could get Chris Pine? Like, that would be an interesting one. Bring him I on mean, as a cadet, like. You'd like Savic, basically. Yeah. Or mm. yeah, or just have the um. Oh, it, when they ended uh, Star Trek with in, in uh, the prime, um, as far as we've seen with the prime time when I'm with insurrection, you have oh Picard getting accustomed to his new first officer. You could have at the end of Discovery a scene similar to that, as sort of a direct handoff to TOS. It's like, oh, what's your name? I'm Kirk. And, and you know, uh, part of that, of course, uh, depends on how long the series goes on. Yeah. Mm. 
I'm hoping for a good seven years myself. Yeah. <laughs> or at least, you know, I'd, I'd like at least three. And then, you know, if it keeps going, hey, that's good too. But, you know, maybe even switch things off and try I mean, playing around the anthology idea. <laughs> if it were me in charge of this, which obviously it isn't, because <laughs> I am not a Hollywood big shot. Um, but if, if it were me in charge of this, I'd be thinking about at least going the Marvel route of lots of different series. Um, yeah. You know, in, in, in lots of different styles. You know, maybe maybe you find a comedy one. Maybe you um, find something that's, you know, I don't even know. But, you know, I, I'd be doing lots of different series. So no, the, based, and start probably... connecting them. That's probably the best uh, thing that you can do with the anthology idea, actually, is that it, when you don't have exactly the same setting in every episode, you can make the tone of each episode vary uh, more dramatically than you could if everything is set in the same exact same setting. It, yeah. it would be hard to stitch together a series like that, especially with production, because every if you do a timeline, different timeline to every episode, you've got new sets, new costumes... Mm-hmm. New characters, well, you, well, new you casting. Don't... But I was thinking, yeah, if you that's why you do series. multiple shows, you know, multiple productions. Yeah. So, um, but I think I we we have the answer here is that if we want something with a different tone, different setting, different all that, um, we need to get me hired on as a writer at CBS so I can develop <laughs> a 25th century Starfleet security series as a sort of comedy noir. <laughs> Interesting. I, yes. No, I, I don't think so. I, I think I think they need to hire you on as a costume designer, personally. Oh come on! <laughs> I can, can do you character sew? writing too. <laughs> I can work with costumes that I find. So it just be me going through the CBS department. Let's put things together. We are kit bashing. Hmm. All right. Um, so let, let's move on. Um, the next topic on the list is to talk about the Founder Challenge. Uh, mm-hmm. We have passed the deadline now, and we're into the voting period. Uh, we have three missions, and I did not have that in front of me. Hang on. Challenge missions. Okay. We got three missions entered, um, which actually you could look at as, as a good thing. I was kind of hoping for a couple more, but... Um, you know, with three, it's it's like you have no excuse not to play them because there's only three, right? <laughs> you hear that community? It's not gonna take. It's not gonna take like you know a huge lot of time out of your day. Yeah, like the AEI um, grind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean we had eight with AEI, how... and that was quite a lot. I mean that was, yeah, that was it, like it took it, a, it took us like the whole voting period to get through them all. Yeah, um, and I had to. You and know, and I we went... should mention that we are not going to do reviews tonight, um, but we we will be doing reviews of each of the missions. Um, but, but not tonight. We're going to wait till a little bit later in the voting period. Um, especially because, um, several of us have not played all of them. In fact, I'm the only one who's played all of them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Also, you know, we, we want to, uh, let the people who will be voting form their own opinions about Absolutely. the, uh, indeed, indeed. Yeah. So the three missions are, uh, old odd ends by Kuchelain74, and he's probably going, he's in the chat room, so probably tell me if I mispronounced that. Um, and it, let's see, I'll read the uh, description here. Uh, while cruising the Denobulan sector, you receive a faint and confusing comm signal that leads to a planet in the grip of a devastating seismic catastrophe. Finding the source of that signal may solve a century old mystery and prevent hundreds of lost lives. It may also cost you your ship and your crew. That last part is kind of important. <laughs> and mm. let's see. The next one is The Mirror of Infinity by Zeb Godwin. Um, he's the guy who we reviewed his mission on the previous show. Uh, mm. Different. Uh, okay. His is Mirror of Infinity, a routine mission to investigate a subspace anomaly in the Seguinus system. Uh, and it's worth noting that actually all three of our guys set theirs in the Seguinus system. Uh, hmm. It leaves your ship trapped in an interdimensional pocket between universes along with two other starships. In order to escape, you must broker a truce between the descendants of the crew of the long-lost U.S. Infinity and their mortal enemies, the Mirror Universe counterparts, and convince the two sides to work together. That, that actually does sound hilarious. Yeah, that is kind of a cool concept. Our final that- entry? <clears throat> 
What were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say that's the one I've played so far. Okay. Mm. <laughs> uh, and, and our third entry is uh, Atlas's Infinity by XR377, um, who, of course, is a, a longtime founder author, making his return after a long absence. Woo! So we're happy to have him back and um, obviously doing uh, something for our challenge. How awesome is that? Um, and let's see, the summary for his mission is investigating the myths of a fledgling spacefaring race leads you down a trail haunted by many ghosts of a lost starship. But as the multitude of roads converge, you may find yourself questioning the truths of this fractured tragedy. Did her lost crew risk the fate of the Quadrant on a selfish attempt to escape? It behooves to remember that in mythology, Atlas attempted to trick another into carrying his burden, for it must be carried mm. for all infinity. Bonus points Ooh. for using the word behooved. <laughs> yeah. mm. <laughs> Bonus points for that one. Yeah, yeah. This, this um, sounds like the basic setup is um, really heavily based on uh, the uh, idea that choices will have really, really long-term consequences. Of I course, it also that. seems. Of course, it also seems like uh, it's something that already happened to someone else, and you're just going there to find out what. I don't know. Well, I'm looking forward to played them all. playing all of these. Uh, yeah, I, I can say that that there are three very good missions. Um, I interestingly enough, a, a lot of them were quite light on combat. Um, mm. it, it's you had sort of three that they came off a little bit similar in storytelling style, mm. um, which is is more more focused on on talking and dialogue and less focused on combat. Uh, but all, all very good. All have have good map work and everything. So I, we'll we'll do full reviews on it uh, as we get closer to the voting deadline. Mm -hmm. So uh, all, all these missions are listed uh, in our post on the official forums in the Foundry section. Um, so go there uh, to vote. All you have to do is uh, give me a PM, either on Twitter or on the forums, or send me an in-game mail. Um, Twitter's probably the best, uh, followed by the forums, and then uh, in-game mail, because I <laughs> I have a habit of mailing things between my t my characters, and, and, you know, so I don't want to accidentally delete anybody's vote while I'm deleting those mails. So, uh, best best definitely would be Twitter. And that would be at Drogan1701. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> So let's uh, let's head into the foundry. Because naturally, we like doing that on this show. Um, so what so is far, <laughs> what's this foundry you speak of? So so far, uh, you know, because we've been kind of pre preparing for an anthology series, a little bit like AEI. Um, this time, dealing with the twenty sixth century, uh, since we have lots of ships and things for that, uh, we've been designing some uniforms. We have been, uh, let's see, we built a bridge for the Klingon uh, and somebody, Durgath, Dreadnought. And we've uh, come up with a passable style for interiors for a 26th century Federation ship uh, that, that at least somewhat match uh, as best as we're able to the uh, interiors of Cryptic Spell and what we saw on the show, of course. And... Uh, so what does that leave us? Well, let's do some Romulan. You know, we got the big Vulcus Dreadnought. Um, and it, it does not have a custom bridge, of course, with it. So let's build one. Or at least start it. Um, and, and I have... Uh, I'll obviously get input from you guys, but I have two kind of ideas that I had been playing around with for this, this uh, Vulcus bridge. <laughs> Um, the first one is, uh, let's put it on the bottom of the ship, which is ironically, uh, something that we, we just saw in the discovery trailer, but the, they didn't the, do it for a the long Senju. time. <laughs> the Senju or however you pronounce that is, uh, it has the bridge on the bottom of the ship. Yeah. I think we'll be fine though, because if we do it for a, um, Rymulin ship, it'll, you know, it, it's yeah, it'll look quite, it'll look quite different. And, and and my thought was basically, you know, glass floors. 
Yeah, I, with, I, I with do some, I, with some walkways along them that are not glass, like sort of crisscrossing or something. Well, I have to say that that's pretty much the um, most obvious thing anytime you have it mounted on the underside of the ship. <laughs> well, I was also thinking that uh, I was hoping that we could do the. Um, oh, you might have this in like an area of the bridge, so like have part of it like in the like the very most front glassed off. And then those pathways lead on to a water weight system because we got to have spaces for the Nanoff crew members. Because, yeah, they're, they're joining, they're sentient yeah. and they, yeah. they, that, that, that was the other, that was the other way. Cause I was thinking back to Sequest and, and, you know, Darwin having these little canals and tubes that he could go through, including a, a little pool on the bridge that he could come to. Yeah, because I like it, it would be interesting if we could sort of blend those two styles together. So have one part of the bridge that's hanging over space and then another part of the bridge, which is an aquarium or basically it's over an aquarium. So we're just mm. horribly complicating this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you got to start. Like you often do, which is, you know, make an outline of walls or something. So here's a question. Get a ceiling and a floor. Do we have any ground scale ships that are Romulan in nature? Yep, we yes. do. Um, we've got the... Oh. Dang Lynn. it. <laughs> I'm blanking on the name. Um, the Lynn, yeah, the Mogai, the Talis. Yeah, those ones. Tavaro. So I knew that we had the Mogai and the and Mogwai and then the... Um, to listen, then the other one starting with a D. The Diradex. No, it, like it's the tier two cruiser or tier two warper. Oh. Deridthau? Tavaro. Mm. That's not the Tavaro. Uh, I'm going to have to go to look up things now. Z store ships, tier two. I'm looking at them right now. Dale. Dale. E H A E L. Yeah, the uh, the Dolan. Yeah, the Dolan. Dolan was, was the free oh. one, I think. Yeah, Dolan. Yeah, it's the Dolan. The Mogai Dial was the list, and then Seastor. Mm. Valdur. I like the Valdur. It's like a hot rod version of the Mogai. Oh, you know what you could do? You could use like basically the back end of the oh the Valdur to structure some of this stuff out. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was thinking because I. <laughs> it's huge kinda, too. That would be kind of cool. Holy crap! It's huge and it's kind of flat. Yeah, I, like that's super on the huge. Underside. Though. I mean, that might be a little too big because. Uh, well, no, it covers, I... the, it covers all of Ruapente. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a problem I'm thinking about: if we decide to do this as a, I have it hanging on the underside, because we've got the empty map ground staring at us. Well. There's two options. There's there's space, I believe, under the no not enough if we, stuff on the ground. Yeah, if there's like five do, that's, and the other the other one meters. is you know, go use what we used to use, which is the black space in the interior map or something. Yeah. Like that. So it's specifically yeah. the one that can't I light that though. Was. I stopped using that because the lights don't work. <laughs> uh, oh oh, I know I know I know. I mean the, I mean we'd have to play with the lighting, but this oh crap. This might not work unless we want to have um, the ship permanently parked at a Mars-type planet. Because we could use the Utopia Planitia lighting for really dramatic stuff. Uh, I don't know, I mean... But it would be... Lim yeah. Uh, it, well... That. Yeah. And the, the empty map in question to use was KV2 Interior O2. Because that has a huge amount of space. So here's what I'm kind of thinking is I know you're kind of uh, hoping for the idea of doing it on top of uh, or on the bottom, but um, you know, what I'm if we were to build it on here. top, but like kind of explore the, uh, well, actually, I mean, I'm just thinking about it now. It would be worth uh, actually loading up the uh, uh, ship itself and seeing how it actually looks. From the outside. Well, you've got we've got it in the costume creator. 
Yeah, so it's it's very similar to the oh, on the outside, it's curving, flat, and most likely green. Not a whole lot of complex shapes, um, so not a whole lot of that fine detailing, so it's pretty smooth. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. It's, it's very smooth. It doesn't, there's nothing about it that lends itself specifically. Well, my first thought was if you show a shot of it from the front, um, it has this part that kind of curves downward like a beak, like yeah. a owl's beak or something. Um, and my first thought was put the bridge on the very front of that. And mm. and have the bridge be sort of multiple levels, like three or four different levels going up vertically. Well, see, I was kind of thinking that because uh, um, back when I think I heard in one of the behind the scenes that when they were talking about when they originally wanted to were envisioning the bridge of the Dideradex, it was going to be this multi-level thing like in the front. So you have uh, like multiple tiers and they just had to abandon that for cost and time. And mm. so when they act, you actually see the... Um, Tideradex Bridge is something much more simil- simple. Well, well, well you, uh, know, you know what kind of got me is that I wanted to curve to have like a glass front to it that you could see out and then curve it around over the player's head, but you can't, we don't have any curve. We can't curve glass, glass, glass. So <laughs> we can't curve nothing. Yeah, but that uh, sounded like a really good idea because it should, it also gives us a few options because in the bottom we have, say, the sequest part of the uh, bridge and then as we go mm-hmm. up we get the command section then maybe like an a, a, a astrometrics or um a navigation section yeah or just well, a curb just... guard because <laughs> i mean we also want to make sure that you know the bridge we're making is also going to be representative of our 26th century romulans mm-hmm. and have you know we we went a little goofy with the uh klingon bridge so why not do that with these guys too yeah or just like make them like like very like uh at one with nature i think might be a good foil so very serious and very solar solemn and you know very interested in horticulture and um basically um biology because that kind of also works from their experience uh, working with new romulus so it would be an evolution of who they've become since um you know, basically in star trek online's time um, the other yeah. the other option that I'm seeing is if you if you go back Dragoon, to the um, the Valkus, you see on the underside there's this kind of flat portion that curves back, and there's this another little portion that curves back down again and towards the front. Oh it's yeah. In there. So then you would do the basically the Tavaros. Those would be all above the map. Have, have uh, you use the Tavaros to make a sort of Romulan looking thing that stretches? Well, I'm still way, pointing away out the from the top of the player's view. If we have it angled the, if we have the bridge angled downward, and the ship is not below, we're going to see the uh, the five foot platform. Well, that's true. So I'm I'm kind of thinking that the so, you, so we kind of have to put it at the front of the ship. Yeah, is probably the best place to put it. Just so from a mechanical. I'm standpoint. thinking it's it's behind this uh, gravity well thing. Um, so you you could get, you maybe actually be able to see the gravity well from the bridge. Oh, there's this little oh there's this little nub thing on the back too, and it's probably like in game it's a weapons for it, but you know that could be the bridge. I mean, it's a big ship. Um, well, one of the more interesting things I remember from TNG is the idea that the Romulan bridge was in the uh, head part of the ship, and the Singularity core was in the tail end of the ship for safety reasons. Yeah, I mean, so wait, putting it in the which end is the front of the ship? <laughs> the not the one with the Singularity core. It's the one really? with the little beak head. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so if you zoom in, the, the you wings got the, the wings sweep forward. 
sweep forward, you've got that line going through the center of the ship, and then at the very front of the ship, you've got these two little. If you sort of just start zooming oh, okay. in, like, looking directly front, you got those two little dots in the front. So, All right, so yeah, it's. But but again, you know that that was the Dideridex. Yeah, yeah but I mean, not. we can kind of carry that thought forward. Hmm. So I'm hoping these things are just like so huge that. At least, if we assume that it, that both of them use singularity cores as a power source, and well, this one does have the exposed singularity core you can see from the ship model. <laughs> oh so probably, yeah, yeah, it's probably a safe assumption, unless that's there just as a you know, it's a decor, it's a decorative feature now, not necessarily a power source. The Romans are just getting very um, wasteful with their singularities. Uh. That, that, that's actually one of the things that, that amused me most about the uh, uh, T6 Romulan science ship. Is oh, yeah, that, yeah and, and I was just thinking about that. Is like you can almost use that because the the similar design cue on the Vulcan, you can almost use both of those for 26th century ships. Mm. And also just because it hasn't been that long that you can imagine those still being in service because there's a mm -hmm. bunch of fed ships that are still used. I mean, in Battle of Battle Procyon, I mean, you've got like Nova class ships out the, or uh, Rhode Island class starships out the window in, um, in the actual Enterprise episode. And then if you play the episode now, you've got, um, oh, star cruisers. Um, what, whatever the player uses. <laughs> whatever the player uses, although we're... Oh, and, and, and let's never forget that the Dauntless, of course, uh, showed up in the Battle of Procyon in Enterprise. Oh, oh that, it's, that, that, it's that probably an easy. Easter egg, yeah. but you know, yeah. whatever <laughs> CG models we happen to have on hand. Yeah, but which is why they did this canon. zoom past really fast, so you couldn't tell. It's there. It's canon. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's the um, yeah, just a bunch of a bunch of stuff. Although I will say, for at least the comedy vibe, um, yeah, with what I'm planning, because I'm going to be focusing on the Klingons in mine. Um, it's going comedy. <laughs> this might be my first almost pure comedy mission, so we'll see. At least heavy comedy, especially when it comes to the um, our chorus on the bridge. Hmm. XR three seven seven is suggesting a good word, which is decadent. Hmm. Oh, for the um, uh, the Klingons or the Romulans. Romulans, I, I guess. I, I don't, yeah. I don't remember exactly, but yeah, I mean, we definitely went that way for the Klingons. Yeah, I think decadent for the Klingons, and then sort of almost like aesthetic, uh, aesthetic for the Romulans, almost kind of like monks now <laughs> arriving at like Vulcan is like the the Vulcan mythology by another route. So just sort of being at one with nature. So very sort of very controlled, very peaceful, very serious. And then the Klingons come in and they're just like, oh, my God, <laughs> can you please get these people to leave? The, oh, one thing I've, I've idea that I find to be hilarious is uh, the idea that the uh, Romulans didn't ex never truly embrace the teachings of uh, uh, Sirach the way that the uh, Vulcans did. And, and that over time, the uh, uh, Vulcans... Um, approach the uh, uh, teachings of Sirach from a, a, a somewhat different angle. Well, of course, we'll see you know, this... if we're talking about Romulan Republic guys, you know, they're they're not necessarily the same sort of military or Tal Shiar guys that we always saw in the TV shows. You know, you got your farmers and, you know, they're citizen soldiers more than... yeah. I think well, like it, just going, uh, keeping along those lines, just go forward and maybe, uh, maybe not necessarily to a silly extent, but just sort of exaggerate what we've got for the Republic now. Well, uh, the, the idea I was going with is based on something that Spock said in, I think it was the one of, one of, one of the TOS movies. I feel it was like the third or the fourth one, something. Um, Cause it, it says that logic is, is the uh, beginning of uh, wisdom or something like that, not the end. Yep. So I was wondering if it, maybe uh, 
uh, reunification means that the Vulcans become more like the Romulans. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just shoot things. Disruptors are fun. Well, the, the strange I, thing that I always thought about, you know, how, how the Romulans were portrayed on the shows is that, you know, they made a big point about saying, oh, you know, we're not like Vulcans. We're not, you know, emotionally repressed, except every character they had was very even and didn't express any emotions. Yes. They, they, they were a very stoic uh, sort of uh, people. And you're like, huh, OK, which kind of makes you. It kind of leads you to the uh, uh, general impression that maybe the the uh, differences between the Romulans and Vulcans were somewhat overstated. Perhaps mm -hmm. they like to think, like the Romulans in particular, would like to think that, or even it goes both ways too. But they would like to think that they're not like each other, when in fact they are. It's that ooh, they're ooh. the um, uh, the episode where uh, Spock or Sarek meets uh, Picard. That that one shows you just how much the uh, Vulcans are like the Romulans on the inside. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. Because you have that breakdown of Sarek. And... So Dragoon, what is it you're playing with here? So I have been trying to arrange these Tavaros in a way so that it looks like the uh, that you have the uh, the two wing tips that come out on the model, and so I'm kind of trying to fake that. Obviously, it's not going to be to scale or anything like that, but I mean, enough that you look out the window and forget that that's what yeah. you're. That's not something we ever have to do. We never have to fake things. <laughs> no, not at all. We just build things straight up one to one. It's like, yep, we got it. All right. Funny thing is because of the uh, way this uh, curves up here, I may actually have to build um, vertically hmm. just to. Kind of get it, keep it still close to the hall at one end, but leading up. This is going to be a really challenging build. So one thing I've discovered is that, you know, build, building something with a glass floor on like the Starbase 24 map, say, it does work, but you're, you're right. You can't use custom lights, but you can change the backdrop. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's... It's yeah, better than there's nothing, some, but... There's some backdrops which are kind of even, still not great. The best one is the, um, oh, the uh, Utopia Polynesia, which I've used for a few, time, uh, a few times for really dramatic lighting. And, yeah, I mean, it, it really works, but you are sort of having to build the entire map around it, and you do have to worry about the fact that that map now has to be set around a planet. Hmm. You know, I just thought of something that uh, I don't think we have the ability to do, but I would like for us to have the ability to do, is uh, to take the um, the uh, memory alpha planet itself and use that as a prop on a different map other than the one that has it baked in. Unfortunately, we don't have that as an object. Yeah, that's that, that's what I was uh, thinking. So I said that would be really cool to have as an object because I it just occurred to me some of the um, things I've done with the uh, asteroid uh, dome objects that were clearly not what they were uh, meant to be used for. <laughs> <laughs> Cause see, see, because if we had that as an object, we could actually. Like take it and superimpose it on a planet that's just slightly larger than it, uh, so we have those dome things sticking out of a, a different planet. Or maybe just make this giant mega structure that's built out of those things. I kind of see what Dragoon is going for here. He's got, you know three different floors which are going to be at three different levels i assume yeah so you got sort of curved ones which curving is good for romulans but I've got, i'm trying to switch over to the uh the donuts and the discs right now to kind of get a more curved feel to it but plus mm -hmm. uh like for instance uh, in the lowest one we can have uh 
the uh, waterfall. Mm. Or not the waterfall, but the uh, the pond with the nanovs. I say we have waterfalls at either end. Ooh, ooh, <laughs> question. Where, 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 where's the Epo uh, area? At the bottom. Hmm. Right, the Wait. Epos can be running around, too. Do, 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 do we, the, epo, uh, the epos are in the aft part of the ship because basically that's the fuel that you use to create this singularity. Oh <laughs> yes, of course. It, it's a hyper. It's a hyper singularity of epos. Ooh, that that that's an interesting one. I said uh, maybe the reason the Romulans are so uh, uh, keen on having people raise epos for them is that epos act as a, a natural uh, energy source due to absorbing ambient radiation. Mm -hmm. That or they're a great catalyst for um, stabilizing a singularity. Uh, it turns out their excrement is uh, ten times better than dilithium. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you you, you mean like that great. thing from Futurama? <laughs> yep. And they, they taste boot. great with some fava beans and a nice uh, candy. Oh, starting to get there. Hmm. Are you it, sure you it, want the disc to be that high above the ring? Uh, can you actually well, see me in can, preview? It, as long as you can see Here. down to each level from the top. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, because the, the, the current uh, uh, height is kind of like two stories. Uh, it's only about what, what five meters is, between each other, yeah. so... You need to I have think it could be more... stairs at, at either end or something like that. Right, but, but each... Uh, well, I mean, each meter is about three feet, and so, you know. Well, this is stove, so everything's a little oversized. And, I mean, the ship is massive. I want it to be grand. <laughs> oh, so, so yeah, you're, 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 you're gleefully going for the idea of making it, you know, um, uh, cavernous. Huge. Yeah, cavernous, that's good. All right, let's try 10 per 10, and I might throw like a, let's see. I just thought of something. In Stowe, do, does the game actually use the uh, uh, infected uh, character models for anything other than Foundry? Um, let's see. It could be part of like old Borg stuff. Well, 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 well. That's exactly as that. That the in the foundry, they're explicitly labeled as people who had been infected with Borg nanoprobes. It's yeah. just I can't think of a single mission in the game that actually uses them or ever what, used them. What about some of the PVEs? Hmm. Because I, I, there was some of the old STFs where it was said, you know, like the old version of infected. That didn't that have some infected Starfleet guys on it? Yeah, they're still there too. And some well, of the infected, like if you go to uh, some of the missions with infected Romulan crew members, mm -hmm. um, they might still be using the infected um, costume. So I think the Borg arc would probably still have a few of them around. Well, it's specifically because... the one where you go to the Romulan ship, and then later um, you're probably then looking at the SDFs. Well, well, the, the reason why I thought of this is because of the fact that I was just thinking about stuff I'd used in missions and hadn't actually finished uh, writing the mission. And one of the things I did is I, I was just flipping through the list of assets and noticed these character models for, let's see, they're fed. I mean, it's a mixture of fed, Romulan, and Klingon characters that have like the like Borg complexion and stuff. And they're it's we're wearing their standard faction uniforms yeah so it's uh, it's it, it yeah I probably think is stfs from stfs or missions or something i i'm going to go with stfs just because i can't think of a single actual story mission that used them Okay, so 
I'm looking at this, and I'm kind of like in the heights. Uh, the nearness mm. to the uh, edge is a little tricky to work with, but I think this could be an opportunity too. So I'm thinking about, and you, the, around this uh, edge, I'm going to put a series of walls. So this is going to be its own layer, and we'll have consoles and whatnot um, running around the edge here. Yeah. And then on this level, I have more consoles, but in here, this is where the uh, the pool is going to be. And maybe we'll put like a rock formation Ooh. in the middle. And then uh, we can have uh, a water volume. A with yeah. Hmm. And since the walls yeah, will be good. down there separating yeah. it out. Yeah, this can be the pool with nanovs. And more consoles. And then up there is where the, uh, the uh, commander is. Yeah, I do like the interaction of the, all the uh, Tavar, uh, all the um, uh, warbirds. I mean, just it really kind of gives this nice. You know, there's a lot of Romulan stuff, but it doesn't immediately look like that we're just putting a lot of Talisas together. <laughs> Except yeah. we are, but still. Except we well, are, when, but when, I mean, when you it, get some walls in there, yeah, you're gonna have some walls at the edge, so you're gonna eventually only Partially see probably the view. the first bits of it. You know, the top, the tips of the wings. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I think this is uh, looking pretty good. Well, one of the big tricks with the whole smoke and mirrors thing is you don't want them to see all of what you did. You want them to see enough to appreciate it, but not enough to fully understand it. Well, you want to show them just enough to get their brains to fill in the rest. Uh-huh. Set this and, aside. And uh, gonna... when, when you do it just right, they'll uh, mentally fill in the gaps that, well, you didn't fill in. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, you know, you want them to think, oh, those are the tips of the wings, instead of, oh, they put a bunch of Tavaros together. <laughs> Although Foundry Author is going to look at that it's like, oh, they put a bunch of Tavaros together, but in a good way. Well, which is I, ironically uh, something I ran into, and I believe it was Kuchelain's mission, where you are on this ground map and you encounter this giant buried ship nacelle, hmm. which is really cool looking. And I was like, oh, I know exactly what asset that is. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, you know, the casual player going through would maybe not know that that is, uh, in fact, a buried Tavaro. <laughs> or, no, a Talis is what he used. Because oh, yeah. he got those cool uh, the ground, the ground damaged spot. ones. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the Talis actually made a, uh, a special damaged version of it for. Uh, the uh, first uh, Romulan story mission. Yep. Yeah. I've used that before too. It's a really well, great way not of selling. damaged, but like old and half disassembled. Yeah. It's great to just to sort of have in the background um, for Romulan colonies. It, it, it looks like a Hulk that, that has been uh, in a, um, a scrap heap. Yeah. I mean, really? Yeah. It's, it's great it's for really This is going to be fun. It, it, except that we, we, you you find out in the story uh, that they didn't actually cannibalize it, they, they they pulled pieces off of it, but they didn't really cannibalize it. The uh, I can't see the Romulan walls in the preview. Oh, are they sort of That's they're annoying. going to the bottom of the layer? Oh wait, no, they're uh, no, I mean they're invisible in the preview. Oh yeah, so the and ones. Then, yeah, if someone's it, pointed that out. It's yeah, those don't show up. <laughs> if if it's the the wall, I think it is. The problem is that uh, when you look at it from the top, you look. You it, it's one of those uh, things I mentioned earlier about one sided props. That this one. Yeah, but that's not all sides, of it. You see a wall, but when you look at it from the well, top, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's that's whatever. something that Zero said to us is that, or no, no, it was Taco who said to us because we were asking him, you know, could you make the the two D um, representation of the volumes, like the the floater volume, have some sort of definition. You know, have some sort of line that tells us how big they are. Um, and he said, no. If it doesn't have any geometry, or or if it doesn't have any textures on that side of it, mm -hmm. you can't see it. Yeah, but I mean, we should and still be able to see a bit of it, like walls. we do with it, uh, it, it this was, wall. It 
like when I started with the Foundry, it was visible. It's just that I think with the uh, artifacts update, when things came back, you noticed that there was a little bit of a difference in the 2D. So it basically re-rendered um, 2D assets. And for the most part, it doesn't have a significant effect. You'll notice with some consoles like, oh, it's looking a little bit different. Um, Romulan walls were not did not get a visual representation. And there's some pretty weird ones. There's, I think it's the, um, oh, there's a ducting for the Borg piece that there's a ceiling variant and a floor variant. I tried putting the ceiling variant on and instead of having the picture, it's a big square black box. So there might be a little bit of weirdness going around with how the 2D image is being represented or translated from the 3D. Hmm. And you got Sometimes weird ones like that one colony building, which is just the main hmm. section of it, just completely invisible. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's like the colony building. You said one. It's not one. It's all, it's all of them. <laughs> well, some of them. Well, some of them do have their awnings. Okay, yeah, the, but still, ha, placing objects using just the awnings as a visual cue is anno annoying. Trust it me, is. I, I've I, done it. it. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I, we, we've we've been there. <laughs> Uh, I think, I think yeah. we've all been there, yeah. <laughs> all right. So trial and error may unfortunately have to be how you do it. Told you this is going to be a tough build. <laughs> I, I There might be a, a different... Um, I think that's the Romulan ship wall that you're looking at. There might be a different wall. That'd be better. Uh, Sutherland said this is a new uh, development. Is this well, is because he used uh, he likes to use these for some of his interiors and it's kind of a, oh affected how he is able to go around and build some stuff. So yeah, it, it came up after the artifacts update. Well, if I remember right, at some point in time, it it used to whenever you're placing objects in preview show you this kind of like a kind of like a whitish box around what, whatever you are placing but yeah, this, I mean, whenever you were moving the object oh. it, it, it had this kind of like a glass pane look uh, to the uh, uh, preview image as you're placing it but I think that's what disappeared and made things invisible well, if, if you go back really far you know what we started with? Wireframes. Yeah, yeah, I remember those. <laughs> those made things interesting because Certainly well, I, I I remember how one of my first uh, missions. Was wow, that, that's uh, really good for trial and error. Actually, yeah. Ooh, that looks pretty. And it's starting to look pretty good, actually. Yeah. Oh I mean, dang! I ooh, holy! Oh, I might have to build the Romulan map now too because I want to. Oh. This is kind of fantastic. I think those walls have some new lights to them. Yeah, they do. They do. They're glowing. Yeah. Yay glowing for lighting beds. sources. They've got glowy beds. The tricky part, oh, though, oh, is that wait. at the top they flare out a lot, and I've got to. Can we, can we raise this, that the, floor up this a little bit? This means they're radioactive. Yeah, we can, but we. Yeah, it's so still going to flare out a lot. Yeah, I was just thinking that you might like it might come down to maybe even putting these right on top of each other, like the the two uh, discs. Anyway, um, what I did was I used the Vorn ground map and put a bunch of uh, things on that, and it actually would show well, the. In in some ways, being able to look at it from the wireframe view was actually an improvement because you didn't just see the one thing that was on top. But the way I understand it, they, the devs can't just make it do either or the uh, flip of a switch. So we're stuck with it. Oh, well. We're stuck with a lot of things. For better or for worse. Okay, so are you going to have uh, people standing on top of the uh, uh, top stone disc? Uh, yes. The very top one would be where the commander would sit or stand. Well, well the I mean, disc, uh, yeah, the disc, there's a secondary layer. Because uh, one thing I noticed when you were doing the preview is that the walls were clipping through the top of the second level. Oh, yeah, and I've got to adjust heights. Uh, 
All right, so all these guys, I'm actually going to probably... It's three, and I'm going to raise this guy up to about 72. Okay, so 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 uh, what are some of the most uh, interesting uses you guys have seen for interior maps that were obviously not what the uh, designers intended? I like uh, caves. Oh, what was it? It was like caves two, where it's just this tiny little cave, but there's a lot of map around it, and I've built space stations on that map. <laughs> hmm. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's where my uh, array is built from Midas Part Two. Um, I, I guess that works. I, I was I was thinking more along the lines of things where uh, you can actually um, you, you're actually using the base map for something, just not what it was meant to be used for. I mean, because what one I was thinking of is like I took one of the Cardassian missions or ground maps that it doesn't really look. As, all that Cardassian when you look at it because that actually uses more of the generic uh, uh, props placed on things than the actual Cardassian ones for some reason or other. But uh, it was from that mission that doesn't exist anymore where you had to uh, go through that uh one of the other NOR stations uh, in, in some other solar system, not Deep Space Nine, but a different... Uh, the Ampok NOR. Yeah, I guess that one. I love these walls yeah, so then, much, but I don't think they're going to work. Oh, no. Come they're on. Just, they just flare out it. too much. They got flare oh. out too much. Okay, okay. I got an idea. I got an idea. I got to switch to the other. No, no, no. We can make this work. We can make okay. this work. Okay. So you line up those two disks right on top of each other. But then you place on the lower level another disk that flares out at like a very, very, very small increment below. So it's going to be two circles on top of each other. But the bottom circle will have another circle, which is making an oval. So those two will be right on top of each other, and then you make another disc, or uh, it might, uh, yeah, another disc should uh, do just fine. And then you move that forward, so you get a lip on the bottom one. So we still get the effect, and we still get some space. It's just now it's going to be, instead of two circles that are staggered, it's going to be a um, circle on top, and then an oval down below. So the basic solution is add more layers. Add more objects. <laughs> Build more. All right. So the only way I can make these platforms work is if they are like sitting in dead center of the platform above. Otherwise, their walls are going to show. And they were working so well to start. Now I got to go back to trial and error. <laughs> I wonder anyway, if cryptic uh, so, designers ever tried to do this sort of thing, and then it's like, why? Uh, yeah, especially yeah, when it comes to the environment art, it's like we got to build this, and all of a sudden, no, it doesn't work. I, yeah, they, they, you know, that's bound to have happened. Or, well, one thing I've noticed on some of the, the missions is that they'll do something that's kind of, sort of like uh, something that you've seen in older missions, but then when you take a close look, you realize that. They actually built a like, like for whatever reason, they built a completely new tree asset instead of simply copying a tree asset that was already in the game. Well, that's just an, a vague example. I, I don't really have a specific. Yeah, because we wanted we wanted to been able, we wouldn't have seen these examples because they wouldn't have made it into the game. Hmm. Well, so uh, well, I mean, because uh, it's it's like with. Uh, you remember the episode where we uh, looked at the uh, the the uh, plants in the old uh, exploration cluster uh, mission? Well, um, some of those were actually assets that 
were copied from Champions Online because you'll actually see if you go into Champions Online and you go into the areas where you have the uh, Gadroon, they're actually so some of the uh, alien plants that you see in Stowe were actually originally created to be used as uh, Gadroon plants for champions. Mm. So now we can raise the question of, do we get more assets from champions? The answer, which is probably no. Uh, <laughs> no. Point. Well, the, 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 the question there is uh, how, how many uh, ad- assets have been created for champions that we could use and... Or the flare is still. How, I hate to say it. The flare is still happening. No. <laughs> it's still too much. No. The, it was so yeah, bad. unfortunately, the walls just were not meant to curve like this. Uh. <laughs> I mean, I guess I got some room to bring them in. Maybe that will work. Hmm. Yeah, because we got a little bit of room, but you're not. Gonna, it's still not that much room. So, and now that well, I mean, if you look at the backside, too. we've. We've still got some room back here, so maybe we're just uh we're out too far. Yeah, maybe. So. <laughs> yeah, that's actually one thing that, that's a good thing to point out is that uh, getting things to work right isn't necessarily about making one big change. Sometimes it's about making three or four small tweaks, and then things fit together. Yeah. Uh, so fill the time. Um, anyone been working on the foundry besides me? Because <laughs> um, you know the answer to that. <laughs> I I've been kind of busy lately, and it's, uh, I have actually done a little bit of tinkering, but not as much as I really would have liked. I have been uh, tinkering with um. The map I was talking about last time, the sort of artificial cave ah. kind of thing, um, <laughs> which is a little hard um, because, as I said, I built the ceiling first. Um, the problem is if I want to use, let's see, what did, what did I use for the ceiling? I used uh, the foundation blocks O2, and unfortunately, if I use the same one for the floor, it blends in and on the 2D map, and I can't tell which objects are the ceiling and which are the floor. Uh, so I might have to use something different for the floor. Just okay. So it stands out. Mm-hmm. Still bring it in a little further. But I think we're starting but, to get there. We got less uh, less coming out at the... Uh, uh, what you'll I have to do is build, out, is build out the floor a little bit on that bottom one. Wish I could remember yeah. the name of the mission, but uh, there was one where someone took the old ESD map and somehow redressed it to make a two-leveled uh, space station interior inside the old ESD map. Oh, oh, yeah, I played that one too. Oh. It, it's kind of cramped, but it was, it was, it but... works. Remedy. I remember the plot of that one and I just not enough details are coming to mind. Uh all I remember is that it, the way it was redressed it wasn't being used for a federation starbase. It was like you were like look uh rummaging around inside a building on a refugee colony or something like that. Mm. My favorite reuse of a, a map that I encountered was somebody used the starbase 39 interior for the interior of the Ryzen cruise liner. Ooh, that's a good one. And it, it, it's like you don't even have to modify it. No, it's because it just, just got that gaping window. The, the nice big curved windows, and yeah, I mean, it just... It you could probably do some it. pretty cool stuff by adding trees on the inside, too. I mean, you wouldn't have to do too many. It's just enough to sort of sell a tropical vibe. Hmm. Pretty much. But as far as what I've been working on, I've completely switched gears after Apex was spotlighted because I'm my original plan was to make my final AEI mission in some time, but I've jumped that ahead and now I'm working on that pretty intensively now. So final AEI mission I'm shooting for getting done in two weeks because I've only got one more map to build 
and then everything else is just objectives and dialogue. Mm. Oh. Cool. And Zero has been, quote, helping me in producering. <laughs> uh, Duncan, I think we saved it. <gasps> we saved it. We saved it. Yes. Yes. And it's, you know, we don't have those, or we've got, do we have gaps in between? Uh, no, some of those? I think, I think wait, we wait, got go all the gaps back. too. Uh, there might be one. Uh, no. Oh, there's I, one I, tiny gap. There's one tiny gap. Are you watching the stream or are you watching the... Uh, you, you could put I, something I'm, there. Oh, yeah, I'm watching the stream. I didn't know you were putting... Okay, I can move this guy over slightly and that'll cover that. Okay. Now that one's a little bit of a gap. All right, but yes. Yes, we did save it. Yes. You can use those walls. Huzzah. <laughs> we can use yeah. these walls and specifically... We just had to this get purpose. them into the right configuration like underneath the... <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Oh, I'm so going to have to use a ROM. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to have to use a ROM. Those are some nice looking walls. Those, those are some, really good. Yeah, especially they're, with the they're lights. Nice they, and they, yeah, and they blend in really well. And especially compared to the new uh, Republic interiors, they do look different. And that's sort of like it's hard to build a Republic interior, but for what we're building right now, they fit in perfectly. I can push this guy back. Hmm. Okay, so this guy. All right, uh, let's try that. I gave it some extra space up front, so there's something to look okay. down on. We shall take a look at this. Because I like that it almost kind of gives has that command center feel to it. Because I mean, yeah, I mean, and it, it blends in well. Like the building block um, discs are working surprisingly well. Um, just to sort of the black on the, um, the black on the green that, that it's okay. still going with the same vibe. I'll tell you what though, we, for the walls on either side of the bridge, what we ought to use is the, the other style of Romulan wall. Mm. What are you thinking? Wall Romulan 01 or 02. Cause you're going to need walls on either side to, to enclose this area. Oh, you mean on the outside? Yeah, like right about where you're standing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll need something. Well, we're getting a, a close to our time limit, so I think it's probably a good place ah. to end it for the evening. So this might be one of those things that needs to be picked up at a later time. Oh yeah, yeah. This is a multi multi build one. Well, I mean, at least we got to start, we, and we, I think we, we got to. We kind of lucked out on our Klingon one because we used buildings for walls, and that took a, <laughs> that helped a lot. And we could. Uh, I don't know. Romulans have terrible buildings. Things. They would be like horrible. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that would work for this. Great for colonies. Terrible for starships. Spaceships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. So, Dragoon, if you want to put up our contact info. Sure. Uh, we can be reached by email at foundryroundtable at live.com. Uh, we are also on Twitter at foundryroundtab. Dragoon can be reached at Dragoon1701. Duncan can be reached at gorgonops underscore SSF. Mark can be reached at MAR Hawkman. And I, of course, can be reached at Green Dragoon. And a uh, extra special reminder to get out there and uh, play the three missions for the uh, Foundry Challenge and uh, send your uh, messages to uh, Drogan, either uh, as a PM on Twitter or uh, as a PM on the forums. 
Anywhere else? You know, one, as you can see on the screen. Um, also, same on the uh, in-game mail. Oh, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Since when did we have a D5-class starship in the Foundry? Uh, the Klingon D5? Uh, it's been there for a while. Oh, the Klingon D5? Oh, okay. I, I just saw this. It's like, wait... There's it's, the wrong it's, yeah, we, we have the D9 as well for quite a while. Okay, yeah, we had the D9 it's... for a while. It's just like, holy crap, we got this other thing. Oh, wait, D5. I was thinking D4X, because that, that, yeah. that's the uh, one we for got the... The, the uh, D5 is a little TOS wrap. wrap yeah, it, it's sort of like cross between the Samra and the um, D7. It, it's, not a, it's not a playable ship as of yet. No. This is the... It's kind of cool looking. I mean, it's not a it's that, not that, overly complicated that reminds design, me but that... it's kind of cool. That they uh, uh, made new Gorn ship models for that, and I went to fly one of them. <laughs> that would be nice. So, Cryptic, um, obviously you got a whole bunch of other ships there that uh, we would love to fly, so you know, <laughs> Indeed. do it. Oh, but yeah, also, sorry, sorry to derail also, the ending. I just wanted to like, wait, is that Foundry News, or just I, I just haven't taken a close look at the game? <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it's been there for a while. Okay. Also, another thing you see in Agents of Yesterday that we cannot do in game is make a uh, the Romulan variant of the D7. Yes. Mm. Very nice. I've always liked that one. It's a good one. <laughs> well, for for the moment at least we we will say good night. Good night. Good night.